So is this at that same time? Or that is, is in the Sao Paulo. Yeah, that is going from the hotel to the venue, Sao Paulo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's that was a really fun memory. Uh, we were on that same ride. We we're looking out the window, and there were about six to eight kids on bicycles that were following the van or the small bus that we had. And they followed us for blocks and blocks. They were flying through these busy streets and jumping over curbs. And you're kind of wondering how they did it. And but we were just kind of blown away watching them. And I did get a photo of the kids. And I remember Kurt and I were kind of looking back and forth at each other, just sort of marveling at where we were at that moment in time. And uh, I got that photo then. It's a nice photo. Yeah, that, that was a, such a crazy show. I think yeah. that's just to cool off the crowd, not to yeah. uh, <laughs> not yeah. any kind of behavior. How many was that? Like eighty thousand? Yeah. 80, was that the biggest crowd that that you guys I played? Think so at that point. Possibly, yeah. Unless Reading's bigger, isn't it? And this is January '93. '93. Um, yeah, I don't know the actual numbers that were there. I think the stadium was pretty full, but it would be up there with the Reading Festival. Yeah. Or I thought that was 89,000 in Reading is at times 300. Wow. That would really? be, there might be 300 on the grounds, but I don't think they could all see the main stage. Okay. okay. Hmm. So, uh, I mean, did you find that there are certain areas of the earth that, uh, that like Nirvana better? I mean, was South America like kind of a big place, or Japan, or Europe, or what? I mean, or is it all kind of the same? I think that's even a question. It makes sense. I mean, it, it's weird though. South America, I don't think they would have seen the difference between Nirvana or Guns N' Roses. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah, it was like just a big rock, American big, rock band. Big American concert. rock band. But, <laughs> I mean, yeah, they were into Nirvana, but, uh, I mean, those just happen to be big shows. They, since bands don't go down there as often, it tends to be you know, larger scale when they do, maybe. But I think. Well, at first, Europe Europe was really big, and all the big festivals, and even, you know, you feel like a bigger band when you go there, because, I don't know, it's just different in a way, maybe more, the infrastructure was better at the time for touring bands, and you're treated better, but, uh, and there was a time when, when Nevermind was hot, there was a time when Nirvana should have been out, you know, playing big hockey rinks. Yeah. to tens of thousands of people but and that tour was booked but then canceled so yeah. the time when Nirvana should have been the biggest they actually didn't play in the states yeah and so what did you guys do during those times I worked with other bands I did some recordings I did some touring with other bands just trying to keep busy I mean yeah that's the ironic thing I mean Nirvana's whole career they never were a band that played a ton I mean I probably only ever spent 20 weeks a year at most no, of no, it, was, it was hard actually yeah. because we did not tour that much. Right. But I mean, we, we were at their beck and call. And yeah, we would be like, please, let's go play some shows. And, you know, <laughs> they're dealing with all their other personal stuff or whatever. So, yeah, when the band's not playing, we're not working. And uh, people ask me a lot of things about what was going on with the band sometimes. And it's like, well, if, if we weren't on the road, I wasn't with them. So I don't know. Yeah. Hmm. Here in the city, we were, you know, const I think you think more about the band standing around town and kind of, you know, where they fit into the local scene. And, and even though they are a big band, but you get out there and you hit the road, and the farther you get away from home, it's almost really strange to, I mean, to go to South America where, you know, I think they speak por Portuguese, and you get. Can't understand why the band is so big there. Mm -hmm. It just really floors you. Was it South America or Rio where, like, we were told not to leave the hotel and um, they yeah, were on the front page of the regular newspaper every day, and they were, we had to have police escorts. And in well, in Rio, yeah, they well both both cities in Brazil they had security for us, and we weren't supposed to just go wander out <coughs> on your own. But that's good advice for anyone traveling in Rio, really. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I mean, how how were these? How was this show or these shows at this time? I mean, were there were there shows that? I mean, were they consistently all great, or you know, did it kind of no? <laughs> uh, Sao Paulo 
was, in my opinion, remarkably bad. And so bad was amazing. It was probably the one I would love to see even in a theatrical release. <laughs> it was really, I thought, just surreal. And uh, more than I can really, you know, explain. I mean, I wish you could see it because it was it was chaos. And then the next night was kind of perfectly normal. But right around this time, I think they were doing a lot of shows that, because they weren't on the road and and working things out and playing, you know, like night after night. Like when you're out on the road playing for months on end, the bands usually lock in and get amazing. But they would go long periods of time without shows and get together and rehearse and some things were not polished enough. So I always remember Kurt would um, on the usually in the first show of the tour, because I think they, they didn't really rehearse <coughs> for the tour. They would just show up and mm -hmm. you know, Kurt would be supposed to be playing a song but he'd forget it. And then yeah. So he'd like have to think for a second, but then all of a sudden he'd kick in and it was, yeah, he was on it. And during the downtime, I think everybody <laughs> would go their own ways, and there would be kind of a bit of tension between the pools. And you know, when you first get back together, I think it takes a few days until mm -hmm. everybody, you know, you realize that you're all kind of a family again, and you're. And this was that and first show, fun. right? The, right. When you get to cut. Yeah, back. I think in the earlier years. When they played more, they were more consistent. <laughs> <laughs> this is Akron, Ohio, right? Halloween '93. Her <laughs> 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 is Barney. It was a good one. Uh, yeah, Chris does the anti Ted dance and white faced PC man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, of course. Yes. <laughs> Slash, Kurt came out with the Jack Daniels bottle too as Barney. <laughs> you see that photo, but I know somebody's got it. <laughs> How is he even playing? <laughs> no. Um, tell me a little bit, yeah, about the In Utero tour. I mean, you know, was that was that a different flavor than a, than a, sort of the year before? Or, I mean, how is it with Pat brought in? on guitar. What did Pat add to the band? Um, well, I guess he made it sound you know, more like the album and uh, took a bit of the pressure off Kurt to play and sing at the same time. I know that was a big deal for him. Um, uh, that photo there is taken at uh, a soundstage down in Los Angeles and that was the rehearsals for the In Utero tour. Yeah. And one thing that was interesting about that is I remember that they were working out this big screen proje projection of Dante's Inferno uh, on the back wall, which was, it was a, an old silent film that Kurt liked and he wanted to use that uh, for this tour. And I thought just visually it was phenomenal that it got cut from mm. the whole deal. I think there was, I think there was an issue of how many people it take to bring a projection crew out on the road and, and set it up and tear it down and, you know, I can't remember it was a touring business and they weren't sure how well the tour would do. So, right, right. Yeah. And uh, so were there only two angels or the two angels we have upstairs, the two angels that were on the two. tour? Yeah. Okay. And so, you know, obviously people have seen that, you know, some don't, one doesn't have a head and some don't have arms. <laughs> um, so what, what abuse did they suffer? Were they just being knocked over or uh, stuff thrown at them? Or? I seen a lot of footage where, and I remember there was, the guitars were used to kind of chop those up quite a bit. <laughs> if you look at them closely, there's a lot of uh, adhesives and screws and wires and stuff that held them together on nightly. And at this time, Craig and Barry, were you guys not involved in the Nirvana thing? I didn't do the In Utero tour. Okay. Yeah, I, I think uh, that's right around when I left. I was out for parts of it. Yeah, as well. Mm. Yeah. So you were at the Unplugged. These are all your photos, yeah. right, Ernie? Tell me about the Unplugged show. Um, that, to me, I mean, it sounded like a good idea at the start. And then we went in to do two days' worth of rehearsals in New Jersey. And I, I remember working on guitars off to the side, having a station kind of set up and doing some routing and things, and 
listening to everything being really out of tune and kind of disjointed. And I remember that was the time when I kind of, I kind of had always thought, wow, they were able to pull off some really incredible stuff. And and I thought this was a really bad idea. I mean, at that point, listening to those, <laughs> listening to those rehearsals, uh, I remember when we left those uh, after the second day, thinking, oh, this is going to be the one, the show that that they really should not have done. And even I think the first run through there was a little rough, but when it came showtime, uh, I remember just shaking my head, thinking, how did they do that? How did they pull it off? Because it was phenomenal. It was one take, too, yeah. right? Which yeah. was, was atypical for Unplugged. Yeah. And there was somebody I was standing there listening to Man Who Sold the World, and there was a, a bit at the end where the cello and the guitars are playing off each other that was an almost otherworldly moment. I was standing there hearing that. Right. Yeah. Was there any, uh, any political weirdness with MTV with you know Kurt wanting the Mute Puppets guys so prominent? Not that I recall. Yeah. Yeah. This is funny. I think that might be the Nevermind UK tour. <laughs> <laughs> is this a, a team building moment? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> team building exercise. At, uh, <laughs> at the end of the tour, they brought out the t-shirts for everybody. I wish I still knew where mine was. I don't know what happened to it. <laughs> <laughs>